Halfland, an ahistorical prehistory. Part four, naked men and dwarvish wars. Lucamos had a dream. He dreamed that he was standing naked in the moonlight by a river deep in the forest. On the far bank of the river stood a gigantic shrouded figure, pallid and luminescent, beckoning him. The waters between him and the figure teemed with fish. Lucamos dreamed this dream for many nights. It disturbed and obsessed him. He started to avoid the daylight, finding deeply shadowed places to sleep while the sun was up, and wandering the countryside at night, looking for the forest and the river of his dreams. His search took him far from his homeland, until he reached the sea. Lucamos had never seen the sea before. It stretched before him in the moonlight, seemingly to infinity. But he knew that it was not infinite, and that he must cross it to find that which he sought. At sunset the next day, Lucamos awoke and crawled out of the crevice in which he had been sleeping. He cast off his clothes and, naked, walked down to the seashore. He walked straight into the camp of some traders who had been travelling along the coast and had drawn their vessel up on the shore to rest for the night. They took pity on this naked, wild-eyed madman and invited him to sit with them by their campfire. When Lucamos asked them to take him across the sea, they laughed, but offered to take him along the coast with them tomorrow, to the next port. They told him that there would be other ships there that might be heading in his direction. There were indeed other ships in that port, but none that had any intention of sailing into the uncharted ocean. The town huddled beneath a rocky headland, and on that headland, Lucamos found a cave. He would sleep in the cave during the day, and at night he would either sit looking out to sea, or go down to the port where, naked as always, he would wander the streets, haranguing anyone he met about the god over the sea, and imploring seafarers to take him over the ocean, following the setting moon. But no ship would take him where he wished to go. Initially, the townsfolk either laughed at him or abused him, but over time they came to believe that he was a holy fool. In the main, they ignored him, but some of them would leave food outside his cave. Time passed and things changed. There was a series of unusually violent storms and exceptionally high tides. Jetties were washed away, and low-lying areas of the town flooded. And Lucamos told anyone who would listen that the townsfolk were being punished for their indifference to the calls from over the sea, and that the path to redemption was illuminated by the setting moon. Times became harder, people no longer came down to the port to trade, and, in any case, there was nothing to buy or sell. Fewer and fewer ships came into port. And still, Lucamos urged the people to sail across the ocean. There was war and famine in the hinterland. A constant stream of starving people flowed into the town, looking for food to beg or steal. But there was no food. And so it was that, as their circumstances became more and more desperate, more and more people hearkened to Lucamos. Soon he had a hundred followers, then a thousand, and then two thousand. Until one night, 
Lucamos and his two thousand followers came down to what was left of the harbour and seized the ships that were still lying there and as dawn approached those ships sailed west following the path that was illuminated for them by the beams of the full moon as it sank into the sea and so it was that in the thirty-sixth year of the common reckoning those ships came to the north-east of Halfland. The voyagers struck land on an area of wooded coastal plain surrounded by hills. The woods abounded with game and the people were hungry. Most of them split into small groups and went hunting. But Lucamos and his closest disciples did not go hunting. They walked up into the hills along a river into the forest and deep in that forest they came to a place where the river teeming with fish skirted a rocky outcrop and Lucamos declared that they had reached their goal the other people who had voyaged over the ocean with Lucamos roamed the woodlands and hunted meat and they were known as the wood folk but Lucamos and his disciples dug tunnels into the rocky outcrop where they would shelter during the day. At night they would emerge and fish in the river. They did not wear clothes and so they were known as the naked men. The wood folk regarded the naked men as holy and generally avoided them. But if one of the wood folk fell ill or otherwise suffered misfortune, he or she would travel to the outcrop where the naked men dwelt and bring them gifts. And, in return, the naked men would pray to the moon and ask that the misfortune be remedied. After the Battle of Drown Daisy Ford, Hogney the Dwarf and his followers had moved south. Under the northern slopes of the dark hills stood an isolated eminence, surrounded by forest. The dwarves cleared the forest and farmed the land. And on that isolated hill, in the midst of that new farmland, Hogney built an enclosure, and within that enclosure a great hall. The Hill Hold, it was called, and from it he ruled over his people the king of the dwarves of the dark hills. In the year 32 of the common reckoning, Hogni's eldest son, who was called Hognar, fell ill and died. This was a great grief to Hogni, who withdrew into himself, passing most of the day-to-day -day business of ruling to his eldest surviving son, Haldan. Haldan was grasping, amoral and ambitious. He increased the burden of taxation on Hogni's subjects, spending the additional revenue he thus generated on good living and on spear dwarves to make sure that the increased taxes were paid. In the year 37 of the Common Reckoning, Hogni died. Haldun became king of the dwarves of the Dark Hills. He started to send his spear dwarves further afield, to the dwarvish lands between South Vale and the Silver Stream, demanding taxation from the farmers there. Those who did not pay would have their farms burned, and although some of the farmers put up some resistance, most paid the taxes demanded. As the population centred on the hillhold increased, some of Holden's subjects moved into the Dark Hills, to the south of Lord's Grave and in those hills they found iron. Holden declared that the newly opened iron mines belonged to the crown, to him, and sent his spear dwarves to make sure that his declaration was respected. And now those dwarves from the lands between Southvale and the Silver Stream, who refused to meet Holden's demands for tax, found not only that their farms were burned, but that they, and their families, 
were taken at spear point and set to work in the mines, digging iron ore while wearing iron fetters. These developments caused some consternation in Delvings and Southvale. The mine lord at that time was Ardban. He was concerned that the opening of the mines in the Dark Hills had resulted in an oversupply of iron in the market, reducing the value of the iron extracted from his mines. The Council of Guildsmen was concerned that those living on the plains between Southvale and the Silver Stream were paying tax to Holden, rather than spending their money on items produced by the guilds, and that refugees from that area were fleeing to Southvale where, unable to find work, they were turning to beggary and crime, and generally inconveniencing the inhabitants. The mine lord and the council of guildsmen therefore agreed to send a punitive expedition south, with the object of overthrowing Holdan. The mine lord provided some of his spear dwarves, and the council of guildsmen hired some additional soldiery. In addition, many of those who had lost their homes and possessions to Holden's tax collectors volunteered to participate. The combined force marched under the command of the mine lord. Holden met them at the Battle of Nygaard, and the mine lord met his end. It was Norby, the leader of the volunteers, who led the remnants of the army back north. Holden, after a pause to allow his victorious soldiers to celebrate and recover from their exertions, marched after him. It is clear from the sources that remain to us that Holden had several objectives. Most pressingly, he needed wealth to reward his soldiers, which he could most easily obtain by plundering the lands between Southvale and the Silver Stream. By doing so in a particularly brutal manner, he would reassert his rule over that territory and cow its inhabitants. And after that, well, he had greater ambitions. If the mine lord and the council of guildsmen chose to attack him, he would pay them back double, in kind. Norby did not care about anything except defending the farmers between Southvale and the Silver Stream, but help was not forthcoming. Ardban had left no son, only a young wife and an infant daughter. Now, the position of mine lord was not by law hereditary. The mine lord was simply whoever owned the mines. And, as Ardban had left no will, which maybe showed a lack of foresight in one marching off to war, ownership of the mines passed to his widow, Girid. Now many of Ardban's male relatives questioned this, and asserted that Ardban had promised that the mines would pass to them. But there was no evidence for these claims. Ultimately, it fell to the Council of Guildsmen to make a ruling on what was essentially a legal matter. The Council was always a strong defender of property rights, and confirmed Girid as the Mine Lady. The idea of a female Mine Lord was a novelty to the Dwarves, and many of them assumed that Girid would not be able to enforce her right to take 10% of anything extracted from the mines. They were mistaken. Not all of the Mine Lord's spear dwarves had marched south. Girid instructed her remaining spear dwarves to immediately kill anybody who was trying to avoid paying the 10% levy. Three or four dwarves were duly skewered, without trial, and after that, Girid's levy was always paid. Norby asked Girid to send more spear dwarves south. Girid replied that she had already lost a husband and many spear dwarves fighting for Norby's folk, and that was more than enough lives to spend in another's cause. She needed all the spear dwarves she had to defend her rights. 
If Holdan marched all the way to Silvermere, she would defend her own property. Norby should do the same. Norby then turned to the Council of Guildsmen and asked them to pay for more mercenaries. The council replied that they were indeed hiring more spear dwarves, but these were to turn back the refugees that were expected to seek refuge in Southvale as Holdan marched north. Maybe those refugees should fight for their freedom rather than running away. And they were providing help. The mercenaries that were already with Norby had been paid until the end of the month. After that, he could pay their wages himself, if he wished. Norby then visited the halflings of Hillfoot. He pointed out that if Holdan defeated the dwarves between Southvale and the Silver Stream, he would then be in a position to attack the halfling lands. Holdan had been present when his father was defeated at the Battle of Drowned Daisy Ford 22 years previously and would no doubt welcome the opportunity to take revenge. The majority of the halflings replied that Hogney had been unable to force a crossing of the Silver Stream, so why should Haldan have any more success than his father? The halflings would fight for their own lands, but not for the land of others. They would stay on their bank of the river and expected the dwarves to do likewise. But there were a few among the halflings who responded to Norby's cry for help. Some of these were younger halflings, seeking excitement. Some had fallen on hard times, or been unlucky in love, or had gained a bad reputation, or were simply unpopular, and saw an opportunity to make a new start. Altogether, about 100 halflings joined Norby's cause. Norby's next problem was getting those halflings over the Silver Stream. It was a very brave halfling who would do so much as dip his toe in the river. Wading across Drowned Daisy Ford was out of the question. A few miles downstream from Drowned Daisy Ford, the river was wider and deeper, but slow flowing. Norby and the dwarves accompanying him felled many trees and lashed these together into a large raft. They then plied the halflings with dwarvish spirits. Now halflings are small and usually drink beer. A draught of dwarvish spirits, fierce and fiery and potent with infused herbs, will have a marked effect on a fully grown man accustomed to strong drink. The impact on the halflings was dramatic and culminated in unconsciousness. And the dwarves then loaded the unconscious halflings onto the raft and poled it across the river. Norby's combined force of dwarves and halflings ambushed Holden's dwarvish army at the Battle of Geitzbin. In that battle, Norby was victorious and Holdan was killed by a halfling slingshot. Holdan's dwarves bore the body of their dead king back to the hill hold. Holdan's son Halvor was next in line of succession, but he was a 13-year-old orphan, and his surviving uncles and aunts jostled for the power behind the throne. Distracted by internal struggles, the House of Hogney turned its attention away from the lands between Southvale and the Silver Stream. And the lands between Southvale and the Silver Stream proclaimed Norby Halfling Friend as their deliverer and acclaimed him as their king. He ruled them wisely and well from a hall that he built in Geitzbin, the scene of his triumph. <laughs>